thanks for joining us today on City Talk. I'm Maria Soreo, and joining us as he does every month, our Mayor John Cruikshank. John, thank you so much for being with us. Hi, great to see you, Maria. Great to see you as well. We want to let the audience know that we don't have masks on. We are over six feet apart, and we have an actual lucite barrier between us, like you do at the city council meetings. Yeah, we have a spit guard. We do, exactly. So we're, we're good, and everything is safe, and that's the most important thing. Yes, absolutely. Very good. John, I wanted to start off today actually with some good news, something yeah. positive. The city council acknowledges residents in our city for birthdays, anniversaries, and you had two really special ones in the last month. You had Roberta Weaver, who celebrated her 104th birthday. That right there is an accomplishment. Well, right. I mean, this is, other than solving problems with the city and for the city, uh, one of my favorite things is actually celebrating our citizens and Roberta Weaver celebrating her 104th birthday. Amazing. Um, and, you know, of course, in today's world, you can't do too much social, but our city manager did attend a uh, drive-by parade for her. That's great. And we provided her with a beautiful bouquet of flowers and a city certificate. So congratulations to her and her big birthday. Her big birthday. And then, of course, Don and Donna Duperon, their 60th wedding anniversary, and they had made a video for the city council meeting where they were on the Zoom. They were actually live on the Zoom. On the Zoom, yeah. And that was really amazing as well. And they were very happy because they have been here since 1974. So they've been longtime residents. And it's just nice to acknowledge people like that, I think. Well, and, and this was great because their daughter, Lori, had reached out to me and told me about the big event. So nice. And just asked, hey, can the city do something? I'm like, heck yeah, we're going to do something for you. So as soon as they let our city staff know uh, about their big uh, anniversary, which was only a couple nights after our actual council meeting, exactly, they are able to not only get the certificate from us uh, congratulating them, uh, but also they joined us uh, during the city council meeting. We got to talk to them a bit and uh, got to congratulate them on their upcoming big anniversary. Yes, two big milestones. And speaking of milestones, for the first time in the 50-year history of this city, you now have a sister city in Sakura, Japan, and you had a ceremony at the city council meeting. And I have to say that it was such an amazing process to watch because from start to finish, you had the same thing happening in Sakura, which was the next day, and you had it on the, the council night, and you were all signing the, the declarations on, on all the documents. Tell me a little bit about that experience, because I thought it was just amazing to watch. Well, it really was, and I, I think before I tell you about the experience, I have to give our deputy city manager, Karina Banyalas. She, she was amazing and she worked with her partners in Japan for several weeks mm -hmm. prior to getting this ceremony. And I've never been involved with something so formal and so wonderful, um, but they were live in their council chambers. I, I think they have like 15 council members and then they have their mayor, of course. And uh, we, we both had an opportunity to have declarations uh, to proclaim our city's sister cities. We had a formal signing ceremony. And um, you know one of the things to note is big difference between the US and Japan. When I went up to sign the, uh, the sister city proclamation, I was very businesslike and did my signature fairly fast. And of course, when their mayor went and did his, he was very painstakingly taking his time to have this beautiful signature. And I felt so guilty after <laughs> seeing him do no. that and seeing my signature compared to his. But it was a great experience for our city. It really was. And I think it's something that you don't see very often. How was Sakura Japan, how were they selected to sister with Rancho Palos Verdes? Well, I think it, it's perfect how they were selected because they've been uh, uh, coordinating. They've had a couple of their middle schools sending students to uh, Marylist Intermediate School in mm -hmm. our city for many years. Um, and so because of that, they actually sent a contingency just to check us out back in January. And uh, I had an opportunity with a couple of other council members, Bradley and Ferraro, mm -hmm. and our city manager and his staff uh, to meet with them. We took them over to Point Vicente and they loved their experience. And we all kind of scratched our head and said, hey, why not do something that neither city has done before? Let's become sister cities. And, and what was great is that it really came from our education side of our city, which we all value and love. It's great. And, and so that was just a natural fit. And Councilman Bradley has been there, is that right? He did. He, he in the process, he uh, does a lot of traveling for work mm -hmm. uh, prior to the COVID experience that we're going through. 
and um, because he was going, I believe, to Tokyo. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a nice bullet train uh, experience, which we don't have a bullet train yet in California. Right. We all waited for that, but yes. of course he was able to get on that and go visit with them and, and attend one of their meetings as a guest. That is so amazing. I mean, what an experience. And yeah. would you like to do something like that in the future? Of, who wouldn't? Yes, that who would be wouldn't? great. I guess to, to throw that out there, because of yeah. COVID, they had to uh, delay the Olympics That's right. um, for a year. So mm -hmm. that'll be in 2021. And right. I believe Sakura City is fairly close to Tokyo. Very good. And so I guess we could all go visit Sakura City and then go watch some Olympics next year. That would year. be great. In right. fact, we're get, doing a show about the the ceremony oh, yeah. and talking to everybody and it's just it's been so fun learning about them what do you see the future looking like with between the two cities well i mean i think you know sister cities are new to me i when i uh lived in the city of el segundo we our sister city was Wymus, mexico and so for me and i was in the jazz band and we actually traveled down to our sister city and had a chance to perform for them and do some music. And How interesting. So I think it's a very cultural thing. I think uh, our city staffs, both of them, will have a chance to provide what's going on. You know, we'll learn, uh, we'll get updates, and also um, it, we'll be able to exchange our cultural values and, you know, art and history and all the things that we do. And so I think it's just we can make of it whatever we want to make of it, and, and that's kind of exciting. And I love the gift exchange was great as well. I thought that was really special. Yeah, no, we uh, they, they gave us some beautiful stuff. And mm -hmm. they gave me a nice, uh, one of the sugar cookies that I always love. Oh, those and I are brought so good. Home. I know, I brought it home, <laughs> and the next day my wife had already eaten it. So yes. I, she said it was great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they have am amazing desserts and foods like that, too. Yeah, so. And their, their art and their pottery and the things Beautiful. They do. Right, and our city manager actually uh, found a piece a plate. of china yes. from his that he used to use as a kid, and he still had it. It was from Sakura City, so that's just. I love that story as I well. Know, it's always fun to learn things like that, for sure. Uh, the second thing we're going to talk about is Alert South Bay Community Survey. Um, tell a little bit about wh what Alert South Bay is first. Sure. Um, so, 13 of the South Bay cities actually are, are using it. It's an emergency notification system. Mm -hmm. And what it does, if there's any type of disasters or emergencies that we need to get that information out to people, uh, it's a system that will be on your, you know, your phone or your, your uh, tablet device where you can get notified that something's happening or occurring. Mm. And so even, even potential things like, uh, you know, upcoming uh, work on the streets where you need to know about that so it might delay your, your trips and that. So th any type of things like that. It'll, it, it works through an Everbridge uh, software system. And I was told that any user can sign up by texting Alert SB, so it's A L E R T S B, uh, to 888 777. Which is pretty easy to remember. I'm sure you'll put that up on the screen. <laughs> exactly, so. yes, for sure. Uh, this is the third survey conducted by Alert South Bay in response to COVID 19. Out of 520 residents from RPV who responded in the 23 question survey, here's what their responses came out. It was interesting. Um, top challenges frustrated with members not following health guidelines social isolation, lack of places to go, general uncertainty for the future, which I think we've all kind of been hit with since this pandemic. I mean, right, it's in line with where we are. Um, you know, I think the reason people get frustrated is they know that the longer people are getting sick and they're getting sick because, you know, certain people are getting into situations without having the protections exactly. and, and masks and, and, you know, that, that leads to people getting cases of COVID. And one of the six criteria for getting uh, the county to give us a waiver uh, for reopening schools or businesses is to have under 100 cases per 100,000 population, which in our world, there's about 10 million people that live in LA County, and so that right. means about 1,000. And so if you've been following, and I know we all kind of been following the numbers, if it is above 1,000, then that's frustrating for people. And, and so they see others out there going to social events where maybe there's too many people at that event or they're not right. f following the guidelines. That's pretty frustrating. We all, we all want to see things open up, our schools, our businesses. That's right. We all want to get back to our lives. 
I think it's, it is frustrating. Um, the school method preferred, 34% said virtual, 32.5 hybrid, 24.4 in-person classroom. I think this kind of speaks to the fact that people are nervous about their kids going back to school. Some teachers are nervous, so it's easier, to, I guess, to say just keep them at home, but then there are the families that really want their kids to get back to school, and then, of course, the people that are sort of undecided in the middle. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the results, about a third of the people said they want it completely virtual, in other words, having their kids at home. Right. Uh, but the other two-thirds actually said they would like some type of either in-person or a hybrid model. So, exactly. So, like you mentioned, um, there's a lot of parents out there that do need to get back to work, and, yes. and you know, they do rely on their kids being at school. And I think they're also worried that, you know, the best instruction for their kids would to be with other kids learning versus being at home looking at a screen. Um, I'm not an education expert, but I have heard a lot of that frustration. And, and so going back to the numbers again. It's difficult. Um, yeah. You know, what's interesting about the virtual learning preparation, because most parents, let's face it, are not school teachers. 36.5 uh, said they were somewhat prepared. 20% said they were prepared. 12% said very prepared. So that is a huge challenge in itself because you're used to being the mom or the dad, not the actual school teacher that's going to go through a math or an English lesson every day. So it's quite challenging. Of course. I mean, teaching is a profession. People yes. are trained to be teachers. Mm -hmm. And so for the rest of us, like I'm, I'm an engineer. I don't know how to teach people in that sort of childhood setting, uh, classroom setting. Um, so yeah, that, that's why we respect our teachers so much because they right. are professionals and they're trained and they know how to do this. And they know how to do it primarily in the classroom. So a lot of the teachers have had to relearn how to teach that's and right. that's been a scramble for them as well. I know this is a lot of challenges, that's for sure. And of course, school did begin virtually here in Rancho Palos Verdes. Um, I know that they're hoping the school district to get them back to a hybrid situation, but right now they are starting at home. Uh, we had a chance to talk to Dr. Chernus, and he did say that when they are preparing for them to come back, where they would do a hybrid model, go to school a few days a week, and be home a few days a week, make the classes more spread out, less kids per class so they could social distance. But for right now, we are back in class virtually. Right. Dr. Chernus is a fighter. Um, in a separate poll from the one we were just talking about, the school district actually did a poll with their uh, parents, and they found that 75% did want to go at least with the hybrid model versus the full virtual. Um, so the majority of parents did want that. He's been fighting for that. Uh, unfortunately, what he's fighting for and what LA County is currently allowing is, is two, different they don't, two different things. Right. And so, you know, the hope, of course, is that the number of cases go down and we could continue to maintain good low levels so we can get the kids back to class the best we can. The one thing we did talk about when I spoke with him is the fact that, you know, it, it was difficult when the, the shutdown happened in March. And so they weren't really prepared for the virtual learning, where this time at least they're more prepared. Uh, kids are on Zoom with their teachers so they can ask questions back and forth. So I think they've, they've thought it through, obviously. They had time to do that. So at least kids are learning while they're at home doing the best they can, which is good. I mean, of course. They, they've That's had the most a, important thing. <laughs> I'm sure they've had a million discussions about how to do this. And yes. You know, there's not one right answer, but um, you know, you're right. The teachers are probably much more prepared right. to start in the fall here than they were when they were told immediately to shut things down in the middle of their semester. So, exactly, and yep. right before graduation, and wow. we also saw how yeah, that went. Exactly. Yeah. The next subject we want to touch upon is, you know, the city has really gone out of its way to help local businesses, small businesses, to stay open as much as possible. We've seen it where you picked up food from restaurants, taken them to first responders, mm -hmm. just to keep their businesses going. And another great thing that the city has done is the free permits so that restaurants, some businesses can actually go outside and open their business, which is amazing. Right. Well, I mean, I think our city has always valued businesses because businesses are the people that live it's here. Huge. and. And it's important that our businesses in this time survive and That's right. ultimately thrive. Right. And so um, we made a conscientious decision to make sure that if any business that's, you know, the barber shops, the hair salons, the fitness gyms, uh, personal care, nail salons and all that, 
they, they have indoor operations or they've mm -hmm. had indoor operations, but there is space potentially outside on some of these locations. Right. And so as long as they get permission from the property owners uh, that they rent from mm -hmm. and also that they follow the CDC or county guidelines, um, our city is going to bend over backwards for them. Of course. You've all come up with so many creative ideas, I guess out of necessity, but it's been just amazing to watch. Well, uh, you know, the great thing about, uh, well, they say American ingenuity, right? That, yes. That's a phrase that, uh, <laughs> that means something. I, I think anyone that's gone out and created their own business, uh, you know, of course, I've done the same and it's not easy. Right. Um, and most businesses don't make it, but the pe the ones that do, they're going to fight for their livelihood, and right. and they're going to be creative about it. Of course, hopefully following the law, I'm sure they are. But you know, in the same sense, they they've got to survive, and and they've got to pay their bills. And once one business falls apart, it affects all of us. It's very true, very true. Now, um, it's census time. And I wanted to touch upon this because I talked to so many people that actually don't understand the census. So we want to ask you, Mayor, tell us a little bit about the census and why it's important for people to participate. Sure. Well, the census happens every 10 years, and they do this nationwide. Um, so every community across the country is asked to answer some basic questions about who they are and their households. Um, it actually affects the number of representatives that are in our United States Congress. Mm -hmm. um, it also affects the amount of uh, funding that goes to different things such as education and um, infrastructure programs, roads and bridges, all the things that we rely on every day. So it's very important that every single uh, citizen fill out their census. Um, I know that our city manager, is he's very competitive. Our city is still the second highest uh, percentage of the South Bay, and our darn competitors in Palos Verdes Estates are slightly better. <laughs> so um, I, I tell all of our residents, please fill out your census so that we can not only get our be fully counted, right. but also Ara Moranian can sleep at night knowing he won this. There you go. Then do it for Ara. Right? Do it for Ara. There you go. <laughs> exactly. If nothing else, do it for Ara. Yeah. And one of the topics that you've been talking about the city council meeting is the parking and how it affects the neighborhoods near the preserves. And I know this has been a, a really hot topic. Um, so many visitors come to Rancho Palos Verdes because of the hiking and the trails and really just to enjoy nature. But especially since COVID-19 and people are getting out more now and they, they want to be outside, the amount of traffic and cars has been, I know it's been overwhelming. And we saw a lot of people from the community come out at the last city council meeting and just really try to explain what was going on in their neighborhood. So is, tell us a little bit about uh, what the residents were saying. Well, so the residents uh, that were most vocal are live in the Del Cerro area, which is an upper part of our city. Mm -hmm. um, our city has 1,400 acres of open preserve, um, and we have lots of hiking trails, as you know. Right. Um, and during this time where people are not getting on airplanes, they are finding other ways to get some exercise and some outdoor activity. And, and so they come to our uh, preserve, and a lot of them come to the Del Cerro area. And, the, the issue with that area is that it, it really wasn't meant to have the number of cars that it currently has. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and also because of social media, people that are, you know, experienced or even mid-level hikers, they go to that area because it's a good hike. Sure. They could spend an entire day out there um, hiking. So um, the, the road is a one way in each direction. Uh, people are waiting for parking spots. There isn't enough parking, so they wait for parking spots by double parking. And right, which is some, dangerous. It's very dangerous, mm -hmm. and for the residents trying to get to their homes, it blocks them. And, and sometimes, uh, unfortunately, this has happened a few times where uh, people that are double parked, they get frustrated, they do U-turns very quickly, and they hit cars that are trying to go around them. So it's not a good situation right now. It definitely isn't, and I was going to ask you about some of the safety concerns on the streets, but you you know, you know, referred to them, the double parking, right. the turning quickly, um, and really just not paying attention. Right. Um, ultimately, the city's looking for a long-term situation. Uh, what are you going to do in the short term to kind of alleviate some of the issues? Right, so short term, we're going to go ahead and, and not allow parking along Crenshaw, south of Crest Road, so that'll give the residents that came out to that meeting some relief. Good. 
And when I say came out to the meeting, you know a lot of the residents actually just joined us via Zoom, yeah. which is actually a great thing, and I hope we do that forever. Yes. Uh, so, so that's good. And so we're, we're going to be doing that. And then what we're going to look at is, oh, and also on social media, our, our city has actually, there's a number of sites that are for the different uh, hiking trails. Right. So they've actually taken ownership of those, and they're going to be putting out the message that there's other locations that people can go and, good. and hike. And so kind of spread them wealth around a little bit in terms of where to start as a trailhead. So that's what the city's going to do as well. That's great. And I know that um, they're going to install gates at the trail entrances, Burma Gate and Rattlesnake Trail. These gates are going to be uh, locked during non-trail hours. Tell us more about that. The gates are going to be huge, I think, right. because a lot of the complaints we get are people are showing up very, very early. 5 a.m., um, I heard. Right, 5 a.m. And, and I, I People that come out to hike, they don't really realize that they're coming into a residential area. They just think they're coming to a hiking area and, and you know, clearly the two are coexisting, but not so well right now. And so yes. with the locked gates, we can keep the gates locked to a certain hour. So let's say it's 7 a.m. Right. So that people start seeing that they can't even get into the trails till 7. So they're not going to show up until, you know, right before the gates open. And then same with the closing. We've had a lot of complaints on people going out there late at night yes. um, to, to use the trails and, you know, look at the stars and that. But unfortunately, when they go out late at night, that also wakes neighbors up that are right along that trail. So the gate's going to allow us to control the trails a lot better. And I think also when you talked about the website information, that will help as well because it will give them more information, like you said, where to go, alternate areas that they can go. Um, at the August 18th meeting, the City Council directed staff to explore a permit parking system. Can you explain how that will work and how does it work for the residents that live adjacent to the trails? Right. Well, there, so currently there is, uh, outside of uh, Crenshaw, there are permit parking only in the neighborhood areas. And that actually, um, you do need a residential permit to park there. And that's worked very well. So that's been very helpful. And we've done that for the last few years. What we're talking about is that last stretch of parking that we've currently going to be uh, not allowing people to stop there for the, until we come up with a more permanent solution. Correct. And what that permanent solution might look like in terms of a permit parking would be that to park along that stretch on Crenshaw Boulevard, you would need a permit. Okay. Uh, the permit could have any type of price range that we could set. You would get that online. Uh, it could have an hour uh, limitation. So your parking permit could be from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then the next group of permits could be from 10 a.m. to 1, 1 p.m. So we can actually uh, limit the time. We could potentially make it a little more expensive so that it limits or allows people to say, wow, do I want to pay 20 bucks to do that when I could be free over here? Exactly. And then what about for people that live adjacent? Do they, would they have to have a permit to go into the trails or no? no. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's what we really want to make sure that our residents don't have to pay to go use the right. things that they've already paid for. Yeah. So, to live there. <laughs> right. So you doing that, we found, and we talked about this, that having an entry permit uh, would be very difficult just because we have so many entry points. Yes. So, um, we are still studying it, though, yes. so I don't want to say we've it's locked in on It's a big issue. It is. it is a big issue. Another issue is that people will park in the area and say, I'll just pay the fine. So how do you deter people from breaking the rules? Uh, it's education and enforcement. Um, you know, at first, people are not going to know. Right. And a lot of people ignore signs, mm -hmm. and they're going to come back, and they're going to see a ticket. Yeah. And then they might, you're right, they might say, well, you know what? it's worth paying that, I'm just gonna pay it. But if we have enough enforcement, and right. every time they come they're getting a $50 or a $100 ticket, yeah, that's gonna get pretty pricey to be doing uh, illegal parking over and over again. So it might deter them. It, it is, so education and enforcement. Education is a huge thing. Also, um, we talked about the social media, and a lot of people don't know that they can come to the City Hall property and park. So I think they're going to incorporate that um, on the social media so that they'll realize there are other places they can park and they won't have to worry about it. No, that's right. Actually, being in City Hall for the maybe the family type of hiking experience, the parking is free. Right. There's restrooms there. There's dog park there. There's right. tennis courts there. Everything. So you can almost make an entire day out of going up to City Hall on the weekend to, to enjoy our hiking and other things. 
Very good. And there is no election this year for the city of Rancho Palos Verdes. There will be for the United States of America, but not here. And I wanted you to explain a little bit about how that works, that you and Mayor Pro Tem Alegria will be here another four years. You didn't have anybody challenging you this year. So tell us how that works. Sure. Well, before I tell you how it works, I do want to say I'm a little bit bummed because this was going to be the first, well, this is the first time our city's had an election during a presidential year. I know. So we're going to get a huge number of voters. And also this, I believe LA County is going to be switching it up. So instead of having the president uh, on top where you vote for the president and having us at the very bottom, I think they're actually reversing it. So I would have been potentially on at the top. top. So I'm a little bummed. And then also Councilman Bradley, he he does have some bragging rights. I believe he's gotten the most votes of any candidate ah. ever. So he'll continue to hold that title. But very nice. So so we opened it up. You know, we obviously advertise it for months, and it's always been the way where uh, if you have incumbents, um, they'll open it up for a four-week period where you can file for election. Um, and if one of the incumbents actually decides not to run, which happens, mm -hmm. um, then you would open it up in an additional week. So because both uh, Mayor Pro Tem Alegria and I both filed mm -hmm. and that it was a four week period. In that four week period, uh, nobody else had filed. Um, and because nobody else had filed, we went ahead and, and uh, canceled the election for Rancho Palos Verdes, which good news for residents is that uh, we save about $130,000. Nothing wrong with that. And uh, good news for me, I guess, is uh, I can focus on all the other things I do, but exactly. I am very honored that, that um, I'm able to get another four years and we'll be sworn in again in December. Well, we're happy to have you here, that's Thank for you. sure. Um, marine protected areas is something I am newly learning about, um, but something very important here because of, of nature and learning about things and how important that they are. We had a chance to talk to one of the rangers that said that people come in, they go down to a marine protected area and they take the marine life out, which is something that they're not supposed to do. So we kind of wanted to bring that up and just educate the public not to do that because especially in Abalone Cove, it's, it's a protected area. Right. Um, and I'm not a huge expert on that, but I understand that there are certain types of sea life that you can take. Right. And there's a certain limit to what you can take, yes. you know, the numbers and the type. Mm -hmm. And so my understanding is that, uh, you know, there's there and there's a number of different sea life that you can't take at all. And, you know, I guess it's another sign of the times. I mean, probably people that maybe don't have employment or that, th these are things that they probably do eat. Right. Um, and so they're coming down to do some fishing. We want people to come down and enjoy it, but just to enjoy the sea life and... <laughs> and don't, yeah, don't destroy don't the sea it. life. <laughs> right. I mean, we certainly have to have limits on that. And, That's right. And, you know, we, we all know that over the years there's been a lot of fishing that's taken a lot of species out of the ocean. And, That's right. And we've been working for decades to try to bring some of those back. So we want to protect that properly. And there, there is signage down there at the tide pools. Yes. And I think the city actually has replaced that. So people need to go down and look at that signage as well. And That's it's right. very clear on what can, can be done. Read the signs, that's yeah, for sure. Exactly. Well, Mayor, thank you so much for always being here and really just giving us more information about what goes on in our city. We appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Maria. And that will do it for today's show. Big thank you to our Mayor, John Cruikshank, for joining us. Thank you, John. And a thank you to all of you for watching. I'm Maria Soreo, and we'll see you next time on City Talk.